Thank you. Thanks and uh, welcome and hello everyone. This is fantastic to see such a full audience here. It's really a, um, a testament to being able to speak but also to the uh, topic and the, um, the theme that we've got running today. Um, essentially I'm just going to give a really brief introduction to what we're going to do in this next hour and then I'm going to hand over to Peter Symes. But today we want to talk about climate change and even saying these two words can immediately paint a, a broad and unruly beast that we can't manage or can we. Uh, this first slide I put up um, I think tells us that the next gen say that we can and we should care for the earth and that's what's written on that little placard up there. And this pic was given to me or taken by my daughter at the climate change student rally earlier this year in Melbourne. And this call to action by the smallest of activists says that our care as garden specialists can support their future. So in this next hour, we're also going to tell you the story of the landscape succession strategy. Pop that up. Um, and what the RBGV is doing to transition the Melbourne gardens. Is there a climate change alliance between the gardens? And the answer is yes. And we'll briefly outline the recent International Climate Change Summit held here at the RBGV last December. Who attended? What happened? and how you, as botanic gardens or landscape managers, can join. And the last but crucial part of this session will be to talk with Joe Brennan and Terry Smythe about the on-ground actions and changes that they are making to the plant collections that they curate and manage here at the Melbourne Gardens. So I'm just going to introduce Peter, curator of horticulture and the lead author of the Landscape Succession Strategy. He's going to talk about the principles, risks, opportunities and how this led to the Climate Change Summit at the Tenet Gardens. So welcome, Peter. So thank you, everyone. Um, I'm actually going to tell, really, this is a horticultural story. It's not a science story. And it was really led by horticulture with the directorship of Chris Cole. We, when we started this journey to develop a landscape succession strategy, we actually run staff workshops. We involved um, the horticultural staff, including botanists. So there was really a ground, um, from the ground up approach which we've applied elsewhere. Just want to talk a, bit, a little bit about Melbourne Gardens for those who don't know it, you know, roughly around 8,000 taxa. Uh, interestingly, if I go back one slide, um, hang on, can't use my own pointer. So Melbourne Gardens is just this bit here, but when you look at the context of these gardens in relation to the city, we're 2.4 kilometres away, Greater Melbourne's around 5 million people. But we have an amazing topography, so it allows for sort of microclimate planning, but quite a high diversity of species. Some gardens may have more, but we've got around about 8,000 taxa, which is roughly over twice the double of natural diversity of Victoria, so pretty significant. One thing you may not know is that our, we call our gardens the gardens of the world, because we did a, a bit of an analysis of what, where our plants came from around the world, and we could find distributions for 190 countries, that's 98% of sovereign states are actually growing in our gardens. So what happened? You know, we're going on our merry way, um, managing our collections, and then we had the Millennium Drought. And I call that a signature event, not because uh, we weren't aware of climate change or we weren't trying to manage our water. Over this time, we had reduced our water consumption by 65%, our potable water supply. Over, over the actual drought period, and we'd started before that. But we're called a signature event because something really changed. And I like to say that temperature entered the cultivation vernacular. As sort of culturalists, we're always talking water. Plant needs more warm water. And then we started saying, actually, we need to think about heat. We need to think about temperature. And for some of these species here, so this, these shots are taken after, I don't people remember the heat wave in January 2009. Three days, all of them I think were over 43 degrees. And, we, and that sort of culminated in Black Saturday on 9th of February when we had the catastrophic fires and Melbourne reached its highest ever temperature. Dave's talked about mean annual temperature, but one of the things that happens when you move the bandwidth, if you like, if your temperature along, you start to fall into having more frequent and extreme events. We're getting extreme events here in, in this period What's it going to be like in 50 years' time? How often are we going to get these? And what plants are going to be affected? 
So you know, we had not, I'd never seen a garvey attenuata get burnt before, or agapanthus, or you know, some of the New Zealand species. But formium cultivars, they were almost being touted as the new answer for water conservation and drought tolerance. They haven't done so well here. It's interesting, you look at cannas, so they're still going, and succulents of course, but you know, I would have thought the cannas got burnt. So already we're getting observations about species. So we realised we had to respond to this. It wasn't no longer just about water. We had to think about temperature and, and the future. I'm going to bore you a bit with some science, a little bit, and some background theory, because I think it sort of informs why some of the things that might affect species. So around the world, there's been quite a lot of studies looking at worldwide forest die-offs, and essentially it's linked to drought and temperature and what they describe as hotter droughts happening um, all over the place. I'll put that classic picture up again. Before I go into that next section, I just want to mention that, that some people might say, well, it's because the trees are dying because they're not getting enough water. <coughs> There's an Australian study done where they looked at 17 forest die-offs across Australia, varying altitude, varying soil type, varying, varying moisture, and they're all dying off, and partly because I think of this increased temperature putting increased stress on species. There's two schools of thought about, and I'm simplifying this, two schools of thought about why um, species uh, might suffer susceptibility under increased warming. Have a thing called hydraulic failure, or a xylem embolism as sometimes called, and we don't operate very well if we get air bubbles in our bloodstream, and plants don't either. If they get air bubbles in their xylem, they can't conduct water. So plant species that don't regulate their stomata, they don't control their water use very well, they just use it, use it, use it. They have very poor mechanisms for limiting that. When they run out of water, you get air bubbles, stops conducting, then you get die-off. Some species can repair, repair those problems, some species can't. And then we have plants on the other end, which we're calling carbohydrate starvation, so non-structural carbohydrate sugars, starches. Some species are very conservative. First sign of drought, heat, shut all the stomata, lock down. But if they do that too often, too long, where's their photosynthesis? Where's their means to make food? And they run out of reserves. And then there's species in between. Some species at this level always are running at the close to the, end, the danger zone all the time because they're relying on the next lot of rain or their roots to find some water. Interestingly, there was a study done in Western Australia that found that this heat wave in 2011 increased shrub and tree mortality by 19%. So a very significant link to heat waves. What about in Australia? We've heard a little bit about what are the, what are the threats to plant biodiversity, and Australia is particularly pertinent because we do have limits in altitude. Our mountains, you know, they're not really mountains, we call them mountains, but they're really foothills. And we have a geographic limit, we have a coastline. Species growing in Victoria, unless they want to start swimming across Bass Strait, they're restricted. But um, Dave talked earlier about other barriers, you know, mountain ranges. There can be other barriers to stop species moving. Plants aren't very good at moving around. And this shot here is um, some snow guns on, on King Billy Track. If anyone has ever been up there, fantastic view. There's my two young lads there. Um, but interestingly, if snow gums don't have any resilience, where can they go? It's on the top of the hill. There's nowhere to go any further. Now, we don't know. We've got snow gums growing in the gardens here, and they seem to grow reasonably well. But it's just something to think about. OK, it's going to start doing this. There we go. The other thing is many plants are unable to track climate change. One study looked at eucalypts. Uh, people, a lot of us love eucalypts. And basically found that eucalypts can, if they're lucky, can move about one to two metres a year. And for our gardens, we're looking at changes that equate to 800 kilometres change in temperature. You have to be pretty fast eucalypt to keep up with that. So some species are limited by the dispersal. They can't keep up with the rates of change. Then we have the higher risk of extinction events, and I'd add drought to that but more intense and frequent fires. Now, you might be in a botanic garden, the peri-urban edge, say Cranbourne, and I know Cranbourne's had, you know, it's got fire risks there, but imagine that getting worse. 
Imagine if you were on a botanic garden and never had a fire before and all of a sudden, because now we're getting 50 degrees and relative humidity is a 1%, 2%, you've got a fire now coming into your garden in the future that you never had before. These are the sort of things we have to start thinking about. And we just make it more and more complicated. You know, new pests might emerge, other might get worse, some might drop out. But you add all this together, there's a cascade of economic, you know, ecological impacts on species. And Dave's already presented a bit of a, a bit of a chart, so I won't talk too much about it. Suffice to say, this is where we were as a botanic garden in 1846. Didn't look exactly like that then, but you know, we're sitting down around here in relation to temperature. Where are we now? We're up here. Been an absolute magnitude shift from when the gardens was created to where it is now. And the, the landscape has changed over time. We actually went through a fairly, I suppose, almost a wetter period here. And I largely think a lot of the landscape we've got is actually being influenced by this wetter period, which was actually quite anomalous. It wasn't normal. We're now tracking down here. So last 20 years, we're averaging around 560 millimetres. Melbourne's not a wet city. And we're heating up this end of temperature. So what does that mean in terms of geographic change? You know, in Melbourne, if we could move the Botanic Gardens, we've got to move it to Dubbo or move it to Musselbrook or <coughs> Warwick and there's a score of other places. It's a dramatic change. And then you think, well, that looks all good on a map, but what's the distance to Dubbo? You're talking 800 kilometres. I mean, that's further than the width of a lot of countries. Huge changes. So what do we do? These are some of the risks that we had to look at, but we, we didn't want to just jump into preparing a strategy because strategies take time, they have to be justifiable, they take a lot of effort. So we decided we'd actually do an audit of our collections as best we could. So we used a, a mechanism called the Koppen Geiger Climate Classification. That classification was originally developed on the assumption that certain <coughs> vegetation will occur in the same climate in different regions, you know, similar climates. So it is based on vegetation. It is very coarse, but it's a bit of a starting guide to how you might look at it. So we selected certain climates, particularly uh, ones around here, so temperate Mediterranean climates, but warmer areas. We then measured our plant tax of where they occur in the world, linking that to that climate and saying, OK, making some assumptions about these climate classifications, which ones are more <coughs> at risk, which ones are less at risk. And this is all we could do at the time. And this is basically what we come up with. It actually ended up being pretty close to Dave's predictions, surprisingly. But we're looking around 35% most at risk. And then this is very coarse, very broad. But remember, we're horticulturalists trying to grapple a very thorny problem. And you know, most likely suited tax are actually quite low. So it started saying to us, well, we need to do something. There is a risk here. There's a real risk. OK, can we... The old adage, you know, plant for microclimates. Well, I actually want to challenge that. And I've got Tessa sitting in the room here. Tessa's a student who's done some work on this and she can tell you the same thing. We bandy microclimates around as horticulturalists and we, it's almost the panacea as a solution. But when you start to look at temperature, there is some value out of it, but there's not a lot of difference across the site. So we actually run a... Basically, did a, started to do what we call a microclimate map of the gardens. So we're, map, we're looking at relative humidity and temperature, quite simple, cheap loggers to use. And so we started to try and identify uh, different sites, primarily from temperature. What did we find? Well, we found across the gardens, if you just looked at mean angle temperature, you get a difference of about 0 0.5, 0 0.6 of a degree. And remember, Dave spoke about rises of three degrees and probably five to six degrees, microclimates aren't going to resolve five to six degree temperature increases. So this really started saying to us, hmm, bit of a problem. But it was interesting because we found sites that were really standing up in terms of their temperature. Fern Gully and surprisingly Oak Lawn, some days were four to six degrees cooler at the maximum end. And these sites, but these are unusual, they only occur here and here. We haven't found this in the rest of the landscape. Can't move all the Australian forest walk into the fern gully and, and everything else. It's a limited area. So 
you know, this is a, a bit of a hero sort of, I can use that jargon, but it, it's very contained. So that's the other interesting thing we found is that where sites had irrigation, some of them were, were up to about a degree cooler, but very rare again, primarily things like the fern gully. So we've measured 25 sites, we're up to 35. This project is continuing. Tessa did some work last year, and those actually aren't shown on here. So we're continuing to work on that, but microclimate planning, it might mitigate some of those higher extremes, but overall it's not going to be good for your overall managing the overall increase. Where microclimate planning can be useful is if you say manage solar radiation. You have a species that's facing west next to a hot path, you can move it to the east, give it a bit of protection, that may help. Or you can find a moister soil environment for that species or impact its exposure to wind. But when you're looking at mean annual temperature, it's a bit of a myth about microclimates. So we decided we needed a plan. Got to have a plan around this. And we realised that while we had strategic plans, we had master plans and we had conservation management plans, etc., we didn't really have a plan that integrated or linked all that together or created a line of sight between all those plants, particularly with reference to climate change. So we need to address things like water, integrated water management, really key part of botanic gardens. What about ex situ plant conservation? Yep, that's a big thing we've got to bring in. Biosecurity risks. Uh, research to inform a management, that's another important aspect. You've got to have that ongoing information coming in. Looking at infrastructure, um, what about our infrastructure needs? Do we need more drinking fountains in the gardens? Big hand up, yes. What about people's well-being and health? Yes, very important, we've heard about that today already. What about discovery and learning? What about uh, plant selection and valuation? We need to bring together how we might be able to evaluate and select plants in the future. And then we've got our line of sight um, landscape succession strategy sitting in the middle here where everything's linking back to it. So yes, we developed this integrated, or well, we saw this need for an integrated strategic plan. But one of the problems for us was that when we looked around the world, we did a worldwide literature review. I spent hours and hours and hours on this, I can tell you, searching for someone else's job I could copy. <laughs> We looked at LinkedIn professionals, botanic garden professionals, horticultural professionals, the, the Australian American Public Garden Association network. I put emails out, people might remember some of them for those who subscribe. And what did I get back? Someone put their hand up saying, I've got a strategy. Silence. No one had anything. So we had to pioneer our own response to climate change. We had to do it all ourselves. Things we had to think about is we had to sort of really act now because we've got trees, rare and threatened species, palms, cycads, long-lived plants, and the decisions we make now have to be the right ones or better ones in the future. We had to think about conserving the landscape and its collections for, for future generations. Education, science, recreation, the things that we bandy around, bandy about as botanic gardens, had to make sure those values are going to be there. So we had to really, and then we had to think about how do we move this landscape so it's more likely to be suitable to that future climate. The measure of success for me, 2090, I want to see that same scene, really. The same character, the same style, but a few of these plants, the climbing hydrangea on that palm might be different. But interesting, a lot of these species on here are already suited to a future climate. Liverstone, Australis, Araucarias. These palms here, there's a lot of species in there that are already resilient and suitable. So what we did is we actually conceptualised landscape succession. We used a living system. And you'll hear about living systems a bit more of the Climate Change Alliance, but it's very relevant for us as botanic gardens to be borrowing from the things that we actually look after. And so we, we, used, we looked at the, as vegetation succession as a concept. So basically, is everyone getting really hot in here? Yes. Someone open the door. I don't want anyone falling asleep because I'll throw something at them. So we, 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 looked at, we looked at succession. So vegetation succession basically for, for us lay people is where vegetation goes through a, 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 a successional change, usually after a disturbance threshold. So you have a bushfire, then you have a change, then you reach ultimately a climax vegetation or what's stable. So that's what we basically used as our concept. 
because we wanted to borrow from the living system. The point I'll make about this though is we're not arriving at a static set point. It's actually, this is a continuous process and we should always, in managing landscapes, looking at it as a continuous process. It's not just a set and forget. And it's about managed succession. We didn't want a climate succession where we started losing tree species because we actually hadn't done anything. So this is about a managed succession, basically to create a landscape that looks like this, that by 2090 is dominated by species that are more likely, and I'm using the word more likely because as Dave's pointed out, it's about risk, it's not about absolutes, are suited to that projected climate, yet we still get this character. You won't even see the change, it'll be so gradual. But there's actually a lot of work to do, which I'll come to. I'm taking too long. So I just want to talk about some key targets. By 2036, 75% of taxi gardens are suited to the projected climate of 2090. Well, that sounds lovely on paper. How that translates for us is we have to find at least 100, and probably more like 120, but I'll say 100 because that's easier. 100 species every year between here and 2036. 100 new species that are more resilient. Based on assessments that have been done, what our vulnerabilities are, that's what we're looking at. It's, it's quite and trying to get new plant material, particularly from overseas, you know how difficult that can be. The other thing I point out, and people might not notice, grab it straight away, plant diversity is 8,400. That's a marked increase for us, and I'm quite proud of our organisation to consider plant diversity as something to aim for. It hadn't ever really been in our language before. So we're going to increase our diversity. And diversity is a resilient strategy in its own right. You have more diversity, there's a chance you can have more species that might surprise you in the future climate. You've only got 50 species and they're all vulnerable, where, where are you left? But we also up the ante on wild collector. We don't have the best wild collector collection. Our current holdings are about 17%. It's not great. But we said we want to get to 35%. A couple of reasons for that. One is being a botanic garden, knowing your plants, known provenance, it's vital for informing botanical science. But also for us, it's vital for informing about species resilience and tolerance. And I'll give you an example. In the gardens, we've got the Fostum and Confertus. People know brush box really well. Same irrigation regime. I've got one tree growing really well. The other one's looking really sad. But do we have the provenance details where those trees come from? No. So we can't make any informed assumptions about these species. We don't know and if you look at the Fostum and Confertus on Atlas of Living Australia, you see it's distribution. There's little outlier populations that go into those lower rainfall areas. The one that's thriving on our central lawn probably comes from that lower rainfall area, but we don't know. So it's really important to know where you get your plant material. And then basically 100% off potable water supply. So we're not relying on potable water supply. Um, in Victoria, the government's already turned on the desalination system and it looks like that'll be going for a while. So we're not out of the woods in terms of water security. We also had to look at improving our green and built infrastructure. And you can't see these slides very well. Um, actually, I might come back. No, I'll, I'll deal with that now. But that, that one there is 26 degrees. That's measuring the surface air temperature of shaded turf. The path was around 66 degrees, which is probably a little bit elevated than what it really was, but say it's 50, 55, and our air temperature is 34. So that shows you, and I think this is the sort of stuff we should be making more visible as botanic gardens, the, what green landscapes can actually do to add to cooling. If you have a tree that's evapotranspiring about 100 litres of water a day, and that's a small tree, that's been equated to 70 kilowatts of cooling power or two air conditioners. I'm talking a small tree. So really large trees are very, very big air conditioners and they don't require electrical energy to actually run. So really important we get that message out. But also, and you'll hear today, it really is about engaging with both botanical professionals but also our public communities about climate change and interactions with biodiversity, etc. So just to sort of follow on from some of the risk assessment and Dave showed you some of the methodology. Um, he also helped us with looking at our grid risk. And when I say grid risk, the gardens are broken up to 10 by 10 metre grids. That's the way we're set up. And you can average out the risk in each grid. And I th one of the things I want to make, sort of point out, is this assessment was done on all our plants. 
Previous assessments that have been done by others have been based only on trees. We, we try to do all our collections. And so this is where we are currently, and you know, green's good. It's in that, between that 20th and 80th percentile, and red's getting at the very, very far end where you don't want to be. And so at the moment, 70% of our species are in the low risk, and about 12% are considered in the high risk under the current climate. But at, you know, the current climate I'm talking about has already shifted, so this has probably changed. What happens if we go to business as usual, three degrees sea rise? Starts to look like this, and you'll see similar patterns, um, and obviously around New Zealand. But we basically double, we double our grid risk from 12% to 26%. And what is at the low risk becomes 40%. So there's quite a big change. What I find useful about maps like this, it starts to show us where our weak spots are, where we might need to draw attention. And I know Kate is our curator of New Zealand collection. She gets quite depressed whenever she sees this. But I see this as an opportunity because we can start to put some research into here, start to look at, uh, at heat resilience in New Zealand species and be informing our New Zealand colleagues maybe you need to think about these species as being vulnerable to heat and do something about it. So it can become a learning uh, mechanism rather than just getting the chainsaws out now. We actually in a way, reposition the New Zealand collection to actually be something that informs us. What else can we do? So we've started playing around with using GIS and climate surfaces. Um, World Clim, which you've heard mentioned. You can model about 19, I think there's up to 35 now, bioclimatic layers and put it spatially on the world. But this is what we're building into our collections planning. So we've just finished our living collection strategy. And this is a big part of that. So we looked at, very simply looked at mean angle precipitation and mean angle temperature. That's very simple climate layers. And we put a, a, a band around that, if you like, to 200 to 1,000 millimetres, because a lot of species at 1,000 millimetres naturally will actually grow up much lower precipitations than that. That's one sort of um, parameter. And then we combined at a temperature of 17 to 21. Now, you heard earlier, 19 degrees for melon might be higher. We actually made 21 at that time because we actually built in a bit of buffer. And we have species already in the gardens from 21 degrees growing quite happily. So it seemed a safe assumption to make. I put those two layers together. This is the areas in the world where those layers intersect. And this is the sort of areas, and this is a very conservative areas, mind you. Um, I'm putting up here because it's based on trying to work it out from degrees. But you know, the big ones are Australia, of course, lucky us. Argentina, South Africa, Mexico, United States. So that's places like Texas, um, southern part of California, New Mexico. But it starts to show us geographically where, if we're looking at plants from a <coughs> geographic collection, where we should be looking in the world. Okay. Almost done. So what were the benefits of this? Or what were the outcomes, if you like, but also benefits? Plant records. We've really dramatically made a big effort to improve our plant records because we need to know what we're actually dealing with. And this landscape succession strategy is really driving creativity in that space. It's asking a lot of questions. Staff scholarships, I've got Joe jo up there just to embarrass her. No, not kidding. <laughs> so our staff are, are going on scholarships to other gardens in other parts of the world to learn about the flora and make that connection. And the organisation's investing in that. We've developed innovative ways around irrigation. This is a, a basically a chart of banking and subsoil. So we're actually irrigating in winter so the plants can reuse it in summer and we're measuring that. Essentially, hypothetically, we can store two to three ornamental lakes in our subsoil. So it's, it's a pretty dramatic thing. Climate risk assessments are all built into our living collections database and are becoming part of our everyday tool. It's all part of our language. Talked about plant selection, useful life expectancy. So looking at useful life expectancy of trees across the landscape, you combine that climate vulnerability, you can start to see where your weak points might be in the landscape. And of course, presentations at numerous conferences, the landscape succession strategy has been to Athens, it's been to UK, been to various places. And what Chris was saying earlier, we're getting the same sort of response. We've never seen anything like this before. And of course, dollars, really important. $3.7 million from the government for the um, recycled or recycled water projects. Substantial funding for collection, um, collection in the field. 
we're planning collections that haven't at a scale that we haven't done in 20 years because we actually now have money because people have seen this strategy and think we want to be part of this of course the organization in the middle there what have we learned essentially applying an adaptive management a continuous improvement sort of process start somewhere the information develops as you go so just in, um, plan and set your targets you implement what you think you need to do but importantly you really need to be monitoring and evaluating that and then adjusting that back in and then you you need to adjust your base on or even the model the assumption that you've made and 10 or 20 years time we might change how we do risk assessments completely we've got to be continually adapting and changing gardens applied this for their water management and over that millennium drought period 65 percent savings and that was pitched at really providing professional development the horticultural staff who actually drove the rest of the organisation. It's all led from the ground up. But in terms of water savings, we're looking now at $5 million of water savings in that time. So it's quite powerful when you start to apply this sort of thing. I'm almost done. So what are the principles? Well, it's about acting now. And someone asked the question, small steps. Yes, do small steps, do something. If you don't know, start somewhere. You generally find you start to get somewhere when you start something. But keep an eye on the future. You've got to act now, look at the long term. Go on now. Develop your understanding of climate change. Develop your own knowledge about your site, your rainfall, what risks that are facing you. Identify what are the risks are to your organisation or your landscape. Everyone's going to have possibly slightly different risks. Some will be very similar, but it's got to be nuanced to your site, I and mean, if you're in another country, your culture, your circumstances. And we've heard about this before, start prioritising species selection for those at less risk for the future climate. We, as horticulturalists, we tend to plant select on our past experience. We look at what we know about plants. The difficulty for us is we now have to be predictive. We have to predict performance in 50 years' time and a rising temperature and a whole lot of other complexity that goes with that. And that's the sort of thinking that we need to do. But it doesn't have to be perfect. It's about doing risk-based decisions, so making better risk-based decisions, but not expecting them to be absolutely perfect and keep adjusting them. Need to embrace adaptive management and continuous improvement. We hear a lot of talk about it, but it is something you just build into what you do. And importantly, you're all here today. Collaborate, collaborate and develop partnerships. Talk to other gardens, talk to other people. And Claire's going to talk a bit more about that. But I think the last one's probably one of the most important. If you want more to find out, find out more about landscape succession strategy, you can type in landscape succession strategy. And plants or plants and landscapes, you'll soon find it. And I'm going to hand over to Claire to talk about the Climate Change Alliance. Thanks, Peter. Um, I've literally got about five minutes to give you an update on the Climate Change Alliance and Botanic Gardens that occurred here in December. And then I'm going to um, uh, introduce both Terry and Joe just to talk about on-ground actions, so what you can do. We do a lot of talking, there's a lot of strategies, a lot of words, but this does need to translate to on-ground. So let me begin. And also, I'm going to just... Um, well, actually, I'll just start. So in December 2018, the Royal Botanic Gardens Victoria hosted an inaugural Botanic Gardens Climate Change Summit. Ten botanical organisations from around the world, as well as three peak botanic garden bodies, Botanic Gardens Conservation International, the International Association of Botanic Gardens, and Botanic Gardens Australia New Zealand attended the summit. There were representatives from Argentina, China, Spain, United Kingdom, Israel, USA, South Africa and Australia, and they were um, specifically selected so I think as Peter pointed out, um, we were looking at some of those areas across the world that had the same geographic relationship to what we were trying to do here. The summit was an intensive three days across both Melbourne and Cranbourne Gardens, and it consisted of talks, workshops and presentations with topics that ranged from regional climate change predictions, challenges for living collections development, and contemporary approaches for assessing plant vulnerability as well as plant selection, 
and landscape design. The outcome of the summit was the formation of the Climate Change Alliance of Botanic Gardens, and the attendees became the founding partners. The Alliance aims to use global collaboration to tackle climate change threats facing plant species. The co-creators of the Alliance signed a declaration to safeguard life by protecting landscapes and all agreed emphatically that the time for action is now. So this slide shows, this slide shows the geographic reach of the Alliance partners and where we're all working across the globe. And these are the landscapes of the current partners. Again, images we're all very familiar with and want to maintain for conservation, research, education and of course to enjoy. The founding partners have been working with their communities and sharing the outcomes of what they've been able to achieve as part of this alliance. Whether it be on-ground actions, support from networks, or in this case, a government declaration acknowledging the Buenos Aires Carlos Days Botanic Garden as part of the alliance. And for Graciela, the director of these gardens, this was a really important acknowledgement. And it went a long way for securing support and ongoing resources to this garden. So that was one of the outcomes, and a really crucial one, for Graciela and the Buenos Aires Botanic Gardens to be part of the alliance. And also, just as importantly, there's been the opportunity to share recent observations and challenges. And Dr. Dr. Nicole Cavender from the Morton Arbor in Chicago outlines the impacts and outcomes of water and winter from just past. So again, this is really interesting for some real-time information coming back to the Alliance so we can understand what's happening in other parts of the world. I'll just pause for a second so you can read this. The challenges that we're all facing. Both Dave and, um, and Peter have already touched on this, but um, it's important to, to outline that the, the Alliance aims to share information and tools and research, including the Living Collections Climate Risk Assessment Framework. It's a pilot project and we've introduced, just started introducing that to our partners. Um, this is a generic temperature and precipitation framework that Alliance members can use to evaluate climate risks for selected taxa against various scenarios of warming and drying. And Peter and I had a bit of a, a time um, uh, explaining this by Zoom, so if anyone's used Zoom, to, to our partners across the globe. Across the globe. But it's um, certainly been interesting and it's been incredibly welcome. So it's something that they see as being really useful and useful in that decision making. It's not the only guide that they use, but it's something that's formed another part of that decision making for landscapes going forward. And we know that there's over 20,000 taxa that were assessed for use in this framework with a primary focus on rare and threatened species of the world. And that's only the first stage of this framework. It also includes uh, the assessed holdings of the Melbourne Gardens. Other products of the Alliance include the development of toolkits, such as this condensed version of the landscape succession strategy, which is almost complete. And that's to assist other members of the Alliance to develop their own strategic responses to climate change. As Peter mentioned, there was nothing out there so again, yeah, Melbourne Gardens had to develop and pilot a landscape succession strategy themselves. So what do you do with things like that? You don't hold on to them, you share them. So the climate change was a brilliant success. And only eight months on, the impressive commitments of the partners is worth sharing with you all. So here's the pitch. Here's the reason why I'm standing up here and uh, why I wanted to explain and give you some background into the summit itself. We already know the Big and Big Network, which we're all sitting here today, an amazing response, is a strong and resilient one. And as garden managers, you are, by default, already part of the Climate Change Alliance and Botanic Gardens. And I'd like to suggest that your first action is to pick up one of these information sheets, they're just sitting out on the registration desk, and officially join the Alliance by completing the membership form on our website. I dare you. This is a living system that we can all participate in. And the Climate Change Alliance of Botanic Gardens is the actions, great or small, of all of its members. Thanks for listening to this part of the session, and now I'd like to welcome Terry Smythe and Joe Brent to join me.